Good day to our guests. I am Bao, your artificial intelligence guide. Today is June 9, 2050. We will start the case time travel in 300 seconds. Thank you. Good day. I am Dr. Jessen Ayab and welcome to Helping Hand Metropolitan Hospital. Your helping hand to the health concerns of today, tomorrow, and yesterday. Yes, you heard it right. That is possible to our case time travel program, where interesting cases from medically relevant times in our history are reviewed by our top geared medical professionals. Introducing Dr. Jasper Bihar and his classmate in the CPU Medical School, Dr. Eloisa Tando. Let's now proceed to the hospital amphitheater where we will find Dr. Jasper Bihar starting with a case. Good day, guests. We are given a case of a 61 year old right handed female teacher with a chief complaint of altered mental status. These are the pertinent findings from the patient history. Her past medical, family, personal, and social history were unremarkable. The patient, as an active practicing teacher at age 61, presents no intellectual impairment. However, selected impairments may display in advanced ages. Females also tend to have greater memory impairment compared to males. The patient's chief complaint started three months ago, which means it is chronic and onset. This gives us a probable etiology of the following. Medication history, as well as personal and social history, would have been informative to accurately pinpoint the cause of the patient's chief complaint. On physical examination, the patient was conscious with fluent speech but showed disorientation to time, place, and person. Higher cerebral function tests revealed the following, comprising the tetrad of Kurtzman syndrome. All other neurologic examination results were unremarkable. Our patient is able to talk, signifies very good oxygenation, which means the airway is open and showing no evidence of respiratory distress. Hence, a respiratory problem contributory to the patient's chief complaint is less likely. O2 saturation and respiratory rate if elicited would support this claim. The patient is ambulatory and answers questions without difficulty in breathing. There are no signs of congestive heart failure like dyspnea on exertion. These are indicators of adequate oxygenation and stable hemodynamic status. This could have been supported with normal blood pressure and pulse rate. The neurologic complaint with an unremarkable history and PE warrant investigation of the central nervous system. The approach to the diagnosis of neurologic disorders involves a systematic process answering the following questions. Based on the focal neurologic deficits highly suggestive of a localized lesion in the brain, the answer to the first question is yes. Now, we have to determine the level of the lesion. The lesion is not on the level of the muscle, neuromuscular junction, peripheral nerves, spinal cord, brainstem, near cerebellum for the following reasons. This means that the patient's lesion is at the level of the cerebral hemispheres. Next is to lateralize the lesion. The patient is right-handed, suggesting that the dominant brain is on the left side. The combination of signs presented by Kurtzman syndrome manifests when the dominant brain is affected. Hence, the lesion is on the left cerebral hemisphere. Finally, let's specifically localize as to which portion of the left cerebral hemisphere is affected. The following lobes of the brain are unlikely to be affected because of the following reasons. Highlighted on this picture is the parietal lobe in its regions. The postcentral gyrus is unlikely to be involved in a patient without sensory deficits. Same is true for the superior parietal lobe. More dorsal lesions around the intraparietal sulcus are also less likely in a patient without deficit and visually guided movements. The angular gyrus and supramarginal gyrus both constitute the inferior part of the parietal lobe. These areas are involved in complex language functions, perception, and processing. The combination of signs in the classic tetrad of Kurtzman syndrome points to a localized lesion in the angular gyrus. We finally arrived at the last question, which is what is the lesion? Any etiology that can involve the left parietal lobe in the region of the angular gyrus can present with Kurtzman syndrome. Toxic causes such as medications and poisons are highly unlikely without a history pointing out an immediate causal relationship with the patient's chief complaint. Without an immediate history of trauma, this is highly unlikely in this patient. Infectious causes represented by the following are also unlikely without prior history or exposure to infectious agents more so without symptoms of an underlying infection. According to this literature, inflammatory and infectious causes are generally subacute in onset. For these reasons, this category is unlikely. 
Vascular causes such as hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes are less likely in a patient appearing to be rather well, without headache and without other typical deficits. Vascular accidents are acute with sudden focal neurologic deficits, making it unlikely in this patient. Certain metabolic disorders causes global disturbance of cerebral function in any age group. However, focal neurologic deficits suggest involvement of a more localized lesion, and without a significant history and signs and symptoms of derangement of other organ systems, this category is unlikely. Psychiatric disorders are also relevant, however, with a previously healthy patient without accompanying signs and symptoms, consistent with a psychiatric disorder in the past, and the presentation of focal neurologic deficits, this category is less likely. Neurodegenerative disorders prominent in the later years of life are highly considered. Representative of this category is Alzheimer's disease, which is a higher incidence in females. This disorder began insidiously and pursue a gradually progressive course, which is consistent with the three-month progression of this orientation in our patient, making this category likely. Primary brain malignancies are space-occupying lesions. Neoplastic causes of neurologic illnesses are chronic in nature. A three-month history of progressive disorientation may mean an early course of an underlying malignancy. Without imaging and eventual biopsy, this category is likely for this patient. Taking all these into consideration, our working diagnosis is progressive disorientation presenting with Kurtzman syndrome, probably secondary to a space-occupying lesion in the left or right lobe. To consider neoplasm, to rule out neurodegenerative disorder. Now, I'll forward you to the expert in the field of labs and imaging, Dr. Tendog. Thank you, Dr. Vihar. The case protocol did not provide laboratory tests. The following workup could have helped us in our diagnostic approach and therapeutic management of the patient. Without a laboratory workup, it is only fitting to request for appropriate imaging modalities to ascertain the diagnosis of a patient with a neurologic complaint. The following imaging modalities could be beneficial, but CT scan with contrast appears to be superior over the others for being faster and simpler and provides greater detail on stroke, brain tumors, and other brain diseases. Presented is the contrast cranial CT scan of the patient, which showed a left parieto-occipital mass measuring 6 by 4.7 by 5.5 centimeters. The following CT scan findings are evident to our patient, and according to Lindsay's neurology, these are all suggestive of malignancy. First, the site, an associated mass effect enough to cause ventricular compression and midline shift, resulting to a right subvulcine herniation, although the herniation did not present clinically in this patient. There are also areas of mixed density, irregularly enhanced with contrast, and there is no clear plane existing between the tumor and the brain tissue. The presence of central, low-density regions that neither enhance with contrast represent necrotic areas or cystic cavities. Lastly, surrounding low density indicates either edema or infiltrative tumor. These findings make neurodegenerative disorders less likely as they are generally not characterized by large isodense lesions that can compress other structures, leaving us with a neoplastic entity causing the patient's disorientation. With the CT scan findings, medical decompression was started using mannitol and dexamethasone. On the third hospital day, the patient became oriented and was able to read. Craniotomy and excision of the tumor were then done. Intraoperative findings showed a grayish solid left parietal tumor and was subjected for frozen biopsy. While waiting for the results of the biopsy, let us discuss tumors that are likely in this patient. Signs and symptoms are of little help to a certain the specific kind of tumor. In general, certain primary brain tumors have a predilection to arise from specific parts of the brain and are prone to occur in particular age groups. Oligodendroglioma and meningeomangioparasitoma are rare tumors that arise commonly from the supratentorial compartment, with limited case reports associating them with Gertzman syndrome. They also occur more often in males and in middle-aged adults. Meningioma, gliosarcoma, and glioblastoma are the more common ones and are more likely in this patient as they tend to occur in the sixth decade, with documented cases occurring in the parietal area with the following incidences. While there are factors that make these malignancies less likely in this patient, histology is the only way to completely rule them out. In this slide, we have pointed out the results of the frozen section biopsy, described in the protocol, which are consistent with the WHO criteria for glioblastoma, also known as astrocytoma grade 4. 
According to this journal on integrated reporting on CNS tumors, diagnosis should be layered, which is written in this format. Thus, in our case, our final histological diagnosis is glioblastoma multiforme grade 4, not otherwise specified. With all the data collected by our researchers from the patient's history, P. Imaging and histology, our final diagnosis is Gertzman syndrome, secondary to glioblastoma multiforme grade 4, not otherwise specified, left parietal lobe, subpulsing herniation right, status post craniotomy. Digging deeper into our final diagnosis, histology revealed glioblastoma causing the manifestations of Gertzman syndrome. Glioblastoma is the most common and the most aggressive malignant primary brain tumor, representing about 20% of primary brain tumors in adults and about 75% of anaplastic gliomas. In a study by Philippine General Hospital, the majority of patients are female, contrary to its worldwide prevalence, with it usually presenting in the 6th or 7th decade of life. Glioblastoma is commonly located in the supratentorial region. In a study by De Rojas et al., the three most common sites of brain tumor are the following. Glioblastoma tends to occur in two clinical settings, most commonly as new onset disease, typically in older individuals, and less frequently in younger patients due to progression of a lower-grade astrocytoma. Patterns of molecular alteration in glioblastoma were identified and placed tumors into four molecular subtypes. The common theme for these diverse genotypic changes is that they affect two cancer hallmarks, sustained proliferative signaling and evasion of growth suppressors. In glioblastoma, variation in the appearance of the tumor from region to region is characteristic. Tumor cells collect along the edges of the necrotic regions, producing a histologic pattern referred to as pseudopalisading. The vascular cell proliferation produces tufts of cells that pile up and bulge into the lumen. Most of the time, the cause of adult brain tumors is unknown, but identifying major risk factors helps narrow down predicted diagnosis. In the given case, however, risk factors were not thoroughly investigated from the patient's history and PE. To date, exposure to high-dose ionizing radiation is the only confirmed risk factor for the development of glioblastoma. A number of associated risk factors are also being explored, including but not limited to the following. Only the patient's age has conformed to this list. However, the evidence for their contributory roles in developing GBM remains inconclusive. For this case, her glioblastoma most likely arose de novo, where the following processes are involved. Collectively, these will result in abnormal growth of neural stem cells and glial progenitors, which eventually caused the growth of glioblastoma. The vascular cell proliferation compressed other adjacent brain structures to which the patient manifested the classic tetrad of Gritzman syndrome. I'll give you back to Dr. Yap for the management of our patient. Good work, Dr. Tendog. For this patient's management, according to the case protocol, there was complete resolution of neurologic symptoms six days post-surgery, and the patient was eventually referred to a medical oncologist and was discharged. The next step is to prolong quality survival. Multiple randomized trials have demonstrated survival benefit with the use of chemotherapy concurrent with radiotherapy following surgery. Use of further adjunct temozolomide chemotherapy has been shown to improve the median survival in patients with glioblastoma in a randomized phase 3 clinical trial. Unfortunately, even with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, the 2-year survival in this patient is only 16%. Here are the median survival in months of every management approach to our patient. To close this case time travel, our patient is a 61-year-old female teacher who presented with a 3-month history of progressive disorientation to place in time, affecting her history of daily living. Upon examination, she was conscious but had altered mental status and had difficulty reading words. Additionally, classic tetrad of Gerstmann syndrome was also noted. General considerations to altered mental status presenting Gerstmann syndrome were taken into account. Granted that further mental examinations and laboratory results returned unremarkable, there is a high probability that the tumor is a space-occupying lesion in the ancillary gyrus, exerting an increased intracranial pressure and therefore causing the patient's symptoms. From these, we drew the primary impression as presented. 
contrast cranial CT scan revealed a mass and tumor excision displayed a grayish, solid left parietal tumor with a characteristic palisading necrosis with microvascular proliferation. From the information gathered in the history and examination, the following differential diagnoses were positive. In order to support the initial impression, histologic findings relevant to the case were reviewed. And a frozen section biopsy confirms astrocytoma grade 4, also known as glioblastoma. Therefore, we have arrived that for this case from the year 2021, the final diagnosis is Gerstmann syndrome secondary glioblastoma multiform grade 4 NOS left parietal lobe subfalcine herniation right and status post craniotomy. Right away, doctor. Date is set to June 6, 2021. Hold on tight. Traveling back in 3, 2, 1.